Okay, so it's on page 34 of your workbook. And again, we have our ticker tape. This is our review. So we've measured our distance always from zero. This is time zero, and each one is one uh, tenth of a second apart. So we measured from zero, what's that distance there? And we plotted it in a chart. And we're just plotting our data now. So we have distance versus time. So we're at 0.5 seconds. And it's 6.8. So each square is worth half a centimeter. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and just below 7. Right there. Oh, no, that's not right. Let's try it again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right there, it's just below 7. 0.6 seconds, we're at 9.7. So 9 is right here. 9.5, so 9.7. And 13 will be a lot easier to plot. So 13 is here. Okay, now does this look like a straight line? Or does it look like a curve? The curve. So we're not going to use a line of best fit. We're going to use a curve of best fit. And so we're going to do the best of our ability to draw a curve. I think we could actually draw our points through these these uh, dots. So we're going to make a curve of best fit. Oh, shoot. Let's try this again. Okay, so on a distance time graph, if it's not making a straight line, do we have a uniform motion? Do we have a constant speed? No, if we have a curve, this is where we have acceleration because the object is speeding up. It's covering more distance in the same amount of time. So when we have a distance time graph and there's a curve, that's going to show acceleration. So it says on the graph, determine the slope of the graph. Well, can we really find the slope of this graph if it's not a straight line? No, the slope's changing. The slopes are changing. What I mean by that is if you were to take a straight line, okay, so in the very beginning, the slope, if we do a, a tangent line, the slope's really sm small, so the instantaneous slope. So that would be the slope would represent the speed at that moment. As we go up, our slope is getting steeper. Our, our tangent line would actually become steeper. We don't have a uniform motion. And so our object is speeding up because the slope of a distance time graph is velocity. Is that clear? Can you see how our velocities are increasing? How we would figure out our, our velocities of a curve is you'd actually have to draw a tangent line and then find the slope of the tangent line. Does that look funny or something? No? How is it? What's so funny? Uh, okay. Okay, so um, the slopes are changing. So what does the slope represent at least? What do the slopes represent? Close? Speed. Distance divided by time is the speed or the velocity. We have a direction here. Okay, so of a distance time graph, the slope is our speed or our velocity because we're going distance divided by time, which is the same formula for speed. Okay, so we're going to do something different. On the next page here, we're going to actually find out the average velocity between each point. Okay, so what we're going to do to figure out its average velocity for each point, we're going to actually ma like make a straight line connecting them, figure out its change of distance over change of time. So we can actually see how are the velocities changing. And we're going to graph that. So uh, what's the average time from 0 to zero, uh, well, point 0.1 seconds? What would be the average time? 0.05 0 0 would be the average. We add them together, divide by 2. Right? 
because if we're going to find the average speed, we're going to use average, our total distance over our time. And we're going to compare in the middle part, right? The 0.5. Oh, 0 0.05, right? Okay, what would be average of these two? What would be halfway? Where's halfway? 0.15. This guy would be point. Two fives and point three five, right? I'm saying, okay, what's the average time here? Five five and point six five. Okay, so we're going to compare these distances. So, for example, this is final minus initial. So, if we're comparing, our final is uh, one tenth of a second, our initial is zero. So at one tenth of a second, we are at 0.4 centimeters minus initially we're at zero. So 0.4 minus zero, what's my change over those two points? 0.4. Okay, our change of time, what's the change of time over those two points? How, how much time has passed? 0 0.10 minus 0 is 0 0.10. So our change of distance over our change of time, so 0.4 divided by 0.1, what would that equal? What does that equal? 0.4 divided by 0.1, not 1, would be 4. 4 centimeters per second. Okay. So our, our change of distance, so what we're going to do for the next guy, we want to say, okay, what is our change of distance between now these two points? Yeah. Yeah, on the original. We're, we're going to graph a speed time graph for this guy. So instead of writing a distance time graph, we're going to plot the speed time graph. And so in order to graph a speed time graph, I'm going to have to figure out the average speed between each uh, two intervals. Okay. So here, what would be my change of distance between 0.4 and 1.2? 1 1.2 .2 minus 0 0.4? 0 0.8. And uh, how much time passed between those two points? How much time passed between 0.1 seconds and 0.2 seconds? Anybody? 0.1. How much time passed? And so our now between these two points, our change of distance divided by change of time, what would that equal? 0.8 divided by 0.1. Okay, so can you see how it's speeding up? It's speeding up here. Okay, the next guy. So we want to compare the next two points. So point uh, 2.6 and 1.2. 2.6 minus 1.2 is 1.4. Scale our time. Change of time is going to be 0.1 seconds between those two distances. And so 1.4 divided by 0.1 is 14. We're going to continue on with the rest of this. So uh, then we had what was our next? 4.5 minus 2.6. So can you finish off this chart? Seven and
we got 9.7, not 9.6, right? Yeah, okay. It would have been 2.2. So 3.3? 33. Okay, so uh, the average speed between 0 and 1 tenth of a second was 4 centimeters. And so because the a it's the average between those two times, we're going to graph the average time compared to our average velocity. Those are the two we're going to graph. And so uh, let's go down here. So we're now going to make a velocity time graph. So average velocity will be over here. So if, did everyone get that down? Get the same thing? Did I do something wrong? It looks good. Okay. Right, 4, 8, 14, 19, 23, 29, and 33. Did the same? I'm guessing yes, because you probably counted that as wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you typed it, usually. Okay, so average velocity is in centimeters per second. E. And we have time on the bottom here, average time, actually, in seconds. And again, we want to go up to 0.7 seconds. So we're going to go every four ticks. One, two, three, four. You feel okay over there, guys, in the corner? Six and point seven. And then our average velocity, we need to go as high as 33. So what's the easiest way to do this? Anyone already graph it? We go up by twos, I guess. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six, eight, twenty. Two, four, six, eight, thirty. Two, four, six, eight, forty. Probably the easiest way to do that. Okay, so we're now going to plot the average speed versus the average time. Okay, so instead of point graphing at 0.1 seconds, what are we actually graphing at? 0 0.05. This point here, 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 and here. Okay, so the very first average speed was 4. So 2, 4, they're going up by 2, so our first point would be right there. Then we have uh, 8, 2, 4, 6, 8. Oh, that's at 1.5 seconds. 2, 4, 6, 8. Then we have, uh, was it 14 or 13? 14. Okay, so at 0.25, we want to go 14. Then we were 19 at 0.35. So uh, you have to, because we're going up by twos, it would actually be halfway between the 19, uh, the 18 and the 20. Then we have 23. So 20 is right here. So 22, 23. What do you notice about this guy so far? What's it kind of looking like? A straight line. Yeah, and so we're having uniform something. It wasn't uniform velocity. Because if it was uniform velocity, it would be just a horizontal line like that. Uniform acceleration, bingo. And that's the point of this lesson. Talk about two things. Um, the area under the graph, which we'll get to, and that a straight line on an average velocity time graph would be uniform acceleration. Okay, now we have 23, I think. Oh, I did 23, 28. And last, was it 28 or 29? 29. And then 33. So this would have been 30. 32, 33. We're going to draw a line of best fit here with your ruler. So 
underline a bad fit, some above, some below. There we go. Then the graph determines the slope and the area. Okay, so first the slope of this graph. Slope of this graph. It's rise over run. We need to find a nice point. We can make a nice triangle. Do you have any nice points on your graph? Does yours go from this guy? Uh, 34? I don't know if yours goes to 34. Is there a nice point down on there? Find a nice point. Doesn't matter. Um, we can go to the very end. I'll go 34, I guess. So our rise would be 34 centimeters for me over that time would be 0.65 seconds. What does that equal? I don't have a calculator. Can I borrow yours, Erin? Oh, actually, I have one. I have a digital one. Aha. So approximately, approximately 52.3. Let's go to the nearest uh, whole number. So 52. What's the units here? So centimeters per second over second. Centimeters per second squared. Okay, so it represents acceleration. Slope of a distance, uh, velocity time graph is acceleration. What does the area under a velocity time graph represent? Does anyone remember this? This will be tested. And that's why I decided to go through this again. So let's say up to 0.7 seconds. Draw a straight line all the way up. Okay, and we want to find. I'm going to use a crayon. I like crayons. They're underrated. Okay, we want to find the area under this curve. Okay, so let's figure it out, and the units can help you. All right, so area. What shape are we dealing with? Triangle. What's the formula for area of a triangle? Matt, say it out loud. Or usually, yeah, or base times height divided by. It's same thing. Yeah. Okay, so what's my base or my length of this guy? Put units in there and tell me what it is. Miriam, what's the base? Liam, do you want to help her out? One of, one of you two. What's the base? What's the base? Yeah, how much time? 0 0.7 and seconds. Okay, time. What's the height? So uh, look at your graphs. You might have little different values. What do you guys get for your height? I got 37. What is, does anyone have anything different? At 0.7 seconds? 0.7 seconds. So when we're looking at 0.7 seconds, how how uh, what's your velocity at that point? 36? 36? Okay, let's use 36. I have 37, but that's okay. So 36 meters per second, and we're going to divide by 2. What happens when we multiply these two? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, who's awake here? Anyone awake here? What's going to happen when we multiply a second by a centimeters per second? They cancel out. Can someone tell me what 36 times 0.7 equals? 25.2? Okay, well, 25.2. Really? And you divided it by 2? 12.6. That's what I'm looking for. So approximately to the nearest centimeter. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. 
So to the nearest centimeter, approximately 13 centimeters. That is the, the area which represents what? Look at the front of our sheet in 0.7 seconds. How far did we go? Distance. It's distance. So area under a velocity time graph is the distance we've traveled. Okay, it's the displacement. Huge concept here. Our distance traveled. Woo! Okay. Hooray. That was fun, no? Okay, you could have a graph on your test, but this stuff's important. That's why I went over it again. Let it, let's put to bed, other than we'll mark our acceleration quiz probably tomorrow. We're going to put to bed acceleration velocity. We're going to get to some uh, work and energy notes. So that is going to be on page, keep flipping, 55. Yeah, oh, keep going, 50, keep going. Oh, did we not do that? Guys, can I ask you a question? Did you guys do the notes on page 56? Okay, let's go through that quickly. Uh, 56. Uh, what page are we on in your workbook? Page 56. So just to review some stuff. Acceleration, I believe the bold stuff is what you have to fill in in your book. So acceleration equals change in velocity over time. Acceleration is a vector because you have magnitude and direction, as long as you have magnitude and direction. Getting this down? Eric? When you're good, say good. Good. Meh. Good. Eric, tell me when you got it. Got it. Okay. So, um, for accelerated motion, the line of best fit is a smooth curve, which we just looked at. A gradually increasing slope indicates that the velocity of the object is gradually increasing or, or accelerating. There's a little spot there for you to draw that quick graph. So that curve there. Come on, guys. Okay, almost. Some of us are faster writers than others. Got it? Moving on? Anyone say no? Okay. All right, an increasing slope indicates positive acceleration. So we have an increasing slope. A decreasing slope, which would look like this, indicates negative acceleration. Increasing slope and decreasing. If you're still using your slopes for drawing your lines, I mean your rulers, you can keep them. Okay. All right, are we ready to move on? Okay. 
got it? Okay. Uh, hello? Give me a second. Something's not right. What in the world? Okay. All right. So, plotting a velocity time graph, a, in, a straight line with an increasing slope indicates that the velocity of the object is increasing with time. And this straight line part's really important. Slope is rise over run, so change of velocity over change of time, which is our acceleration. A slope with an increasing value indicates a positive acceleration. A slope with a negative value indicates a negative acceleration. Okay, and again, just draw the graphs really quickly. You can just go dt and a straight line down. Make it quick. All right. Page 61 in your workbook. Okay. Um, put this over here. So work and energy, it was not until the 1600s that Isaac Newton described the important relationship between forces and motion. We all know the story of the apple falling on his head. Um, a legend says Isaac Newton discovered gravity when he saw an apple fall from a tree, or fall from a tree, not, maybe not on his head. So we have something called potential energy, which is the ability to do work. Okay, Stored energy is potential energy. It has the potential to do work to do work. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. So there's different types of energy. You might have heard of mechanical energy, solar energy, right? We're going to specifically look at potential and kinetic energy and something called work, okay? And maybe work in a tr in little different than maybe what you're used to. We're not talking about working on homework, <laughs> okay? We're talking physics work. Okay, so what's a force? A force is a push or a pull. You've probably learned this before, yes? No. Okay, well, it's a push or a pull of on an object. That's a force. Now, that pull can be from an actual external, external source, like a person, or it could be from, say, gravity. So there's the force of gravity, for example. Push or pull on an object. Measured in Newtons, uh, the symbol for Newtons, thankfully, is just N. Nothing confuse it, confusing. A Newton is equivalent to a kilogram meters per second squared. A kilogram meters per second squared, that's a Newton. Okay, and so we have Newton scales. And so, for example, you put a weight on a, on a, a Newton scale, it'll tell you how many Newtons of force is being applied. Um, we can basically predict the formula here, so if force is in newtons, what has the unit of kilogram? What is the unit of kilogram? If you wanted to measure something in kilograms, what are you measuring? The object, weight or mass more specifically. So mass, and what has the unit to meters per second squared? How? Acceleration. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Let's write that a little better here. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. Objects at rest do not move because their forces are on, acting on them are balanced. So technically, right now I'm standing. I'm not moving. Is there a force acting on me? Which force? Gravity. Now, I'm not moving, which means there is an opposite force pushing back up at me. That force is called force normal. Okay? If, so when you're standing on the ground, the earth is actually pushing back up at you. The only way to make a dent into the ground is if we apply more force downwards than is pushing upwards by the earth. And we call that normal force or is that force normal? It's called force normal. Um, because obviously, if you're, there is no motion, and we know there's a downward force, there would have to be an upward force to balance it out, to cancel them each other out. Okay? It's equal to the downward force. So the, the pressure from the earth 
pushing back will be equal to the same downward force. Uh, okay, objects will move when an unbalanced force is applied, so only if it's unbalanced. So right now, I'm pushing on this desk. I am applying a force. You can't tell, but I am. Why is it not moving? Friction is a type of force. It's pushing backwards. As soon as I overcome the force of friction, I now have motion. Okay? So when it's an unbalanced force, then we have motion. An unbalanced force is when the force acting in one direction is greater than the force acting in the opposite direction. That makes sense, right? And then object gain energy and acquire a change of motion. So now the object has energy. I'm transferring my energy to the object and that my potential energy is turning into kinetic energy, which is energy of motion. So how does this relate to what we've been learning to, learning about? Well, it actually is related because force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we know how to find acceleration now. Does everyone have this? Yeah? Okay, let's go through these guys. Objects in motion tend to remain in motion and move at a constant speed in a straight line. The application of unbalanced force to a moving object will ca cause it to either speed up or slow down. If the force is in the same direction, the object will speed up. If it's in the opposite direction, it'll slow down, which makes sense. If you are uh, driving on the road and someone rear ends you, you're going to right go faster forward. It's going to push you, launch you even more faster forward until you apply your brakes. If you are hit head on, you will slow down <laughs> eventually, right? Or if something's rolling, you put a little force the other way. You can still go a little forward. Depends if your depends if your force is greater than the other opposite force, right? So that's why if you're in a war, you're in a minivan, they're in a smart car. Okay. Well. And that's the type of stuff you actually get to calculate in physics 20, is these car accidents. All right, does everyone have this down? Yes, no? Colin, you got it down? Yes? Yes? Miriam, down? Okay, moving on. In the absence of any external unbalanced forces, all objects can maintain uniform motion or stay at rest. Problem, friction is everywhere, right? In a real world, you have friction, okay? So a lot of times when you do physics problems in physics 20, you say ignoring friction after every sentence. Ignoring friction, if this is the case and this is the case, determine this. And then you get to expand. After you get used to that, you get to build upon. Knowing the coefficient of friction. So different objects have different, what we call, coefficients of friction. Can someone explain what I'm talking about? Okay, so if I was standing on ice versus I'm standing on sandpaper, okay, who do you think has a larger coefficient of friction? It's actually, yeah, sandpaper, right? So a almost zero coefficient of friction would be like ice, perfect ice. <laughs> So, yeah, well, air can still cause friction, technically, right? Air resistance. Air resistance. Right. An object in motion will stay in motion without the requirement of energy input to remain in uniform motion. So, obviously, there's some act. Uh, is this movie going to play? Let's see. Maybe not. So, I'll see if the video after. Okay, I'll get the video after. When an object is lifted, there is a force that is applied to the object in the opposite direction of the force of gravity. Actually, I'll do that. Up. 
go through these and I'll get the videos after. happen if the same force was applied to two objects having different masses? They would move at different speeds or they'd have actually different acceleration because force equals mass times acceleration. And so uh, the greater the mass, the greater the, if we're talking about it's going to have more speed or more acceleration, right? So the greater the mass, if you have more force, if one object has more acceleration, sorry, more mass, and the same force is applied. Which one do you think is going to move faster, the, the lighter object or the heavier object? The lighter object, right? If you push a, a big boulder that's really heavy, same amount of force, the really tiny one, it's going to move a lot faster, the tiny one. Um, okay, I don't think this is going to play right now. <gasps> Oh, but you need volume. Volume. Such an important thing. Disregard. Oh, it was on. Let's try it again. Boot. The second law describes how an object accelerates or changes direction really bad when quality. a force I is applied to it. Pull up the actual video, hey? The change depends on the magnitude of the net force. The second law also states that the acceleration due to a given force is always in the direction of the force. The mass of the object is also important. The larger the mass, the greater the force needed to make it accelerate or change direction. The second law can be written as F equals MA. This formula is saying that applied force, or F, equals mass times acceleration, MA. This formula is used to describe the motion of objects under all kinds of circumstances. If a ball is thrown horizontally, it will continue forever unless a force acts on it. The Earth's gravity is a force that pulls on the ball and it falls to Earth in the direction it is traveling. So we're going to actually get to get to some problems now. So uh, we're going to apply this sec Newton's second law, which is force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay. So we have a formula. Um, force, do you think it's a vector or a scalar? It can be either, but it's usually a vector because when you apply a force, is it in a specific direction? Yes. And so we also need to know the direction of our acceleration. This formula, guess where you can find it? Formula sheet. Yay. Ah, this is such a simple formula, right? Really easy. Force equals ma. So our force, it says what is the force being applied if we have a mass of 5.68 kilograms times it's accelerating at 6.2 meters per second squared. All right, someone needs to grab their calculator and calculate this. Bruce is in your locker. Okay, somebody who has one with them. Help, help, help look an eye out. 6.2 times 5.68. Don't make me do the long way on this. 35.8. Point two one. Okay, so sig dig. How many sig digs? Two, so it would be 35. What's the unit for force? Anyone remember what the unit for force is? A newton. A kilogram meters per second squared is equivalent to a newton. 35 newtons. 
All right, next one. So again, formula substitution, uh, substitution answer, put your units in it, pretty simple. Oh, I had it there. Ah. Get a force of 450 newtons applied on an object, and the object accelerates at 9.56 meters per second squared. What is the mass of the object? Okay, so if force equals ma, how do we get mass by itself? If it's being multiplied by A, we're going to divide both sides by A. And that will be gone. Because we want mass by itself. So mass is equal to our force divided by our acceleration. What's our force? 450 newtons divided by 9.56 meters per second squared, approximately 45. What is it actually equal to? 47.07. How many sig digs? Three. So 47.1, is that correct? What's the unit for mass going to be? A newton divided by a meters per second. It's a kilogram. The reason why is we know a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared divided by a meters per second squared. These are completely gone. We're left with a kilogram. Okay. Did one more. Uh, can we skip three? Sure. Oh no! Is that what is acceleration? No, let's do three. Let's do three. This time we're asking for acceleration. How do I get acceleration by itself? Divide by. M, mass. So, acceleration is force over mass. What's my force that was applied? 7,200 newtons divided by a mass of 3,250 kilograms. Oh, two, close to two. We want four sig digs, though. What do you get? Someone have a calculator? You can divide this. 2.215. 2.215. And three sig digs. What's the unit going to be for acceleration? Meters per second squared. Okay. Okay. All right, if there is a direction to say, I would say it. These technically were scalars because there's no direction given. Um, and four, I think, let's take a look at four really quickly. Does everyone have this down? I'll give you a moment. And then the rest of the class will be work time. Good to go? Oh, yeah, let's do this one. I like this one. Okay, uh, semi-truck with a mass of 1,600 kilograms is traveling at 110 kilometers per hour. In an emergency situation, the driver steps on the brakes and brings the car to a full stop in 17.8 seconds. What is the force that's required to bring the car to a full stop? All right, so if we're looking force, and force is mass times acceleration, do we know mass? Yes. Do we know acceleration? No, we don't. So we have to find acceleration, which is final velocity minus initial velocity over our change in time. Okay, so if my semi truck is traveling 110 kilometers per hour, and then comes to a stop, what's my final velocity? Zero. Do we have a problem with our uh, velo velocity here? Yes. Uh-oh. What's wrong with it? We want meters per second. We have kilometers per hour. So just down below, I'm going to do a conversion. 110 kilometers per hour. 
time. Kilometers are our top. We're going to put it on the bottom. Anna, that's why you don't sit there usually. Okay? Help you finish the whole question? Can you just listen then instead of talk? Okay. Jaden, same thing. Listen up, okay? Hours, seconds. So we have uh, one hour has 3,600 seconds. So can I borrow someone's calculator? Aaron, do you mind? Okay. 100. Oh, oh yeah, I just can't pull mine up. 110. Okay, so it's going to be 30.5 repeating meters per second. Okay, so now we know we can put that in as our final velocity. And how much time did it take? 17.8 seconds. Okay, we can have a negative acceleration. If there's no direction. It does mean we're slowing down. So divide that by 17.8. We get one point, what? Oh, I'll, sorry, I should write this in. Thank you. So that would be 1.7166. And we don't want to round this. Meters per second squared, and that's a negative. We can have a negative force. It just means opposite direction. Okay. So again, we're not going to round this guy because it's not our final answer. We're using our exact values to our end. So now can we find acceler our force? Yes. Force equals mass times acceleration. Our mass was 16,000 kilograms times our acceleration is negative 1.7166 meters per second squared. Times that by 16,000. We want how many sig digs? Three. Did you guys get 27,465? Yeah? So two, three sig digs, 2.75. Times 10 to the 4, is that right? Tell me if I'm wrong. That's good? Oh, negative, thank you. So the opposite direction, Newton. Okay, so the reason why it's a negative force, it's o the opposite direction that he's, he's actually moving. So the brakes are applying that force in the opposite direction to get him to stop. All right, so. Uh, your get you the rest of the class to work on the practice questions using force on page 65 and 66. Okay, 65 and 66.